Welcome everyone tonight to our second in the series of the Legacy Press Talks presented in conjunction with the New York chapter of the Guild of Book Workers. Um, my name is Karina Reynolds. I'm the executive director of Center for Book Arts. And um, it's just such an honor to be able to present this speaker tonight. Um, Francisco Trujillo is the Drew Hines Book Conservator in the Thaw Conservation Center at the Morgan Library. Previously, he worked at Columbia University Libraries, the Jewish Theological Seminary Library, and the Library of Congress. Um, he has a master's in library science with an advanced certificate in book and paper conservation from the University of Texas at Austin. His research focuses on the materials and techniques of medieval manuscripts, French Romanesque binding structures, and Coptic bindings from the collection at the Morgan Library. He is the editor of Theodore C. Peterson's Coptic Book Bindings at the Pierpoint Pure Morgan Library, published by the Legacy Press. This long awaited publication, which came out during COVID, um, which is why we're celebrating it tonight, <laughs> um, uh, includes an introduction by Mr. Trujillo that details the circuitous history of the collection from Egypt to New York to Rome and back to New York City, as well as the equally Baroque story of the efforts to get the work published, which um, I happen to know was a really long time coming. Um, so we have copies of the book here uh, for sale. If you're tuning in online, you can um, purchase one on the website uh, at the event link um, that you received tonight. And if you're here in person, I heard that Frank is gonna be happy to sign your copy of the book. So um, without further ado, please give a round of applause to Frank. <laughs> Um, hi, uh, thank you uh, for the very kind introduction. Uh, thanks for everyone who showed up and everyone who's viewing uh, at home, um, taking time out from watching the US Open. I think that's what I'm gonna go do after this, but you can watch it at home while you're watching this as well. Um, so I'd say uh, hello and welcome to everyone. And I'd like to thank the Center for the Book Arts for the invitation to speak today. Uh, to Jane Mahoney uh, for co coordinating this and for uh, Carolyn Wood for coordinating the event. And uh, of course, I'd like to thank uh, Kathy Baker for uh, publishing, uh, at the Legacy Press for publishing uh, this volume. Uh, I'm gonna be speaking about the topic that I've been delving into for the past 17 years, the Coptic binding, book binding collection at the Morgan Library and Museum. Uh, the Coptic bindings collection at the Morgan Library consists of original 9th and 10th century bindings of over 50 manuscripts discovered in 1910 in the Fayoum Oasis in Egypt. J. Pierpont Morgan purchased the collection en masse from the dealer Arthur Sambon in 1911, soon after their discovery. The bindings have been described, referred to, and discussed in the century since their discovery in a variety of publications. The most comprehensive description of their construction, materials, and influence, Theodore Peterson's Coptic Book Bindings in the Pierpont Morgan Library, has now been published by the Legacy Press. This presentation will discuss the particulars of the collection and its discovery and the long and winding road to the publication of Peterson's book. The manuscripts and bindings that form the collection were discovered in a well in the village of Hamuli, approximately 60 miles southwest of Cairo in the Fayoum Oasis. At the time of its purchase, the collection was, and still remains, the largest collection of Coptic manuscripts in the world from a single location. The manuscripts formed the library of the Monastery of St. Michael, a monastery that was unknown until the discovery of its library. In fact, this collection is the only evidence of that monastery existing. The volumes date from 822 to 914 and the um, Christian era, uh, based on uh, or the common era, sorry. <laughs> uh, based on colophons and the manuscripts, although some of the binding decorations may date from at least a century earlier. Additional significant groups of Coptic manuscripts are in the Coptic Museum in Cairo, and about two dozen from the Monastery of St. Mercurius near Edfu, Upper Egypt, dated between 979 and 1053, also the common era, that are at the Br British Museum. Um, one can see El Fayoum circled at the top of the map where Hamuli was located 
and Edfu to the south in Upper Egypt. So they're pretty far away from each other. <clears throat> Theodore Peterson writes of the Humuli find, quote, 50 book bindings dug out of the sands of Egypt. Some 30 were fairly well preserved with their sewings mostly intact. 10 were torn off and badly damaged, but could without much difficulty be identified with the volumes to which they belonged. The remaining 10 bindings were only partially preserved and could not be identified with any particular manuscripts in the Coptic find, end quote. One can see from this image of the location of the find, the truth of his statement that the books were really dug out of the sands of Egypt. The reason the collection was of interest to Pierpont Morgan beyond his general disposition towards manuscript collecting, was that he had a lifelong fascination with Egypt. He was 34 when he first traveled to Egypt with his family on a three-week trip in December of 1871. Years later, he would write to his wife, Fanny Morgan, that he would return to my beloved Egypt for the rest of his life. And he was true to his word as he ventured back in 1876, 1882, 1909, 1911, 1912, and 1913. During his last visit in 1913, he became ill and was transported from Cairo to Rome, where he died at the age of 75. In between his first visit and his fateful last journey, he visited Egypt at least a half dozen times. Each time he followed a similar pattern. He would decamp to Europe in the late fall travel through Italy and onto Egypt, where he would visit Cairo, Luxor, Karnak, Abu Simbel, and venture through oases and desert. Morgan spent his days in Egypt in the manner of all tourists by visiting and even climbing Great Pyramids of Giza, by sailing in the Nile in a traditional Dahabia, and by posing on available monuments. He also funded many excavations for the Metropolitan Museum as their board president. Photographic evidence from four of his trips show, uh, at the Morgan Library show a consistent circuit of famous sites revisited with different guests. There are several ways to interpret Morgan's interest in Egypt, as an escape from the everyday, as a connoisseur of art and benefactor of museums, and as a heartfelt inquiry into the roots of Christianity in an ancient land. He would eventually purchase his own specially outfitted dahabia, the Karga, were his Egyptian sojourns. The purchase of the collection in 1911 dovetails perfectly with Morgan's enduring love of Egypt and his interest in Christian art and artifacts. The Coptic excavation sites where all the newly discovered relics of earliest book binding have been found were not large and wealthy centers of population, but generally small towns, villages, and monasteries skirting the edge of the desert and too poor to import the luxury goods of Alexandria and Rome. The bindings speak to this point. They are brown leather, likely goat, pasted over bookboards of laminated papyrus, strips of cloth and plant matter. They are, simply, they are simple when one speaks of their constituent parts, but those simple pieces form one of the earliest types of book binding traditions known. However, the covers of the gospel book MSM 569, that's Morgan Manuscript 569, pictured here, were quite elaborately decorated with red leather tracery and gilt leather and were in rather excellent condition. It was the fact of the excellent condition of some of the manuscripts that led to speculation that the bindings and the collection were not from the 9th and 10th centuries and that Morgan had been fooled into purchasing an ersatz collection. The letter, this letter from Belle de Costa Green, Morgan's personal librarian at the time of the Coptic purchase and the first director of the Morgan Library when it became a public institution in 1924, addresses the accusation that a fake collection had been purchased. She says, quote, the New York world, which hates you personally, as you know, and will probably always do so, has published an article this morning say that the, saying that the collection is not genuine. And I am writing to ask your permission, or rather your opinion, as to the wisdom of my giving to the New York Times, copies of the letters I have received from scholars all over the world, in which they state that this collection is of inestimable value and actually priceless. She continues, it makes me perfectly furious that they be allowed to conceive the idea that you do not know what you are purchasing. And more than that, they should be made to realize that what you have done for America in this matter. I suppose you think I am crazy. I wrote you in the beginning that I am mad and I am mad. I don't care what anybody says of me personally. 
but if I had your permission, I would not allow the world to make such disgraceful misstatements unprotested. Morgan responded, unbothered, via telegram. What world says unworthy your time or thought would ignore others, will straight, set straight, love, going Ike Saturday, flitch. And that was his, uh, his nickname. So he didn't really care. He knew they were real. She knew they were real. It was great. Um, but uh, Belle Green did raise a salient issue in her letter to Morgan when she mentioned that scholars from, from when she mentioned scholars from around the world. The discovery of the manuscripts did evoke a sense of responsibility in Morgan and Green to provide scholars with access to their contents. Father Henri Evernot was hired first as an intermediary intermediary between Arthur Sambon, the dealer of the collection, and Morgan, and then to oversee the restoration project of the manuscripts. He was a professor of Oriental Studies at Catholic University and was to become inextricably bound to the history of the collection at the Morgan. The volumes traveled from Paris to New York in the spring of 1912. They were briefly viewed by Morgan and Belle Green. Because of their poor physical condition, a plan of restoration was set in motion by Father Hebernot. He proposed sending the volumes to the Vatican Library for restoration. Morgan agreed as he wanted to produce a photographic copy of all the volumes. One of the reasons the Vatican Library was chosen was because of its prefect and head of its restoration lab, Father Franz Erling. He was known for his innovative approach to the restoration of ancient manuscripts, and the restoration studio had several skilled binders in its employ. Uh, as you can see, they're all pictured here. Despite Father Early's experience restoring ancient manuscripts, or because perhaps because of it, his first act upon receipt of the Coptic collection was to separate the manuscripts from their bindings with his desk scissors, as Theodore, Theodore Peterson describes in this quote. Although this seems almost shocking to modern conservation sensibilities, it did make sense at the time, considering uh, that the import and study of historic or significant bindings was not yet an established scholarly practice. Early's main goal was to preserve the contents of the manuscripts, which meant that the bindings were somewhat in the way of that directive. Despite the abruptness of the separation of the bindings from their manuscripts, this act actually probably ended up being an overall positive for the preservation and study of the bindings as entities unto themselves. The restoration project took a very long time. The manuscripts arrived at the Vatican in 1912. A few of them were repaired over the next year, but in 1914, the project was slowed and then delayed by the outbreak of World War I. Several members of the restoration team fought in the war. It wasn't until 1919 that restoration work resumed. In 1915, Father Erla was replaced by Prefect Father Achille Ratti, who continued to support the restoration. Um, Father Ratti was Prefect until 1919, and then he became Pope Pius XI in 1922. I think he looks a little happier being Pope than he does uh, any other. Pope. By 1919, there were many changes that had occurred. J. P. Pont Morgan died in 1913. His son, Jack Morgan, continued the funding of the restoration project and the photographic facsimiles. Father Hebernot, at Green and Jack Morgan's instruction, continued to find and purchase Coptic leaves and manuscripts and handed them over to the Vatican for restoration. In between 1912 and 1929, the manuscripts and bindings were restored at the Vatican Library. Thousands upon thousands of photographs were taken of each page and binding for the facsimile edition. Eventually, 12 sets of 56 volumes of reproductions were produced. The sets were given for free to various libraries around the world to fulfill J. Pierpont Morgan's original intent to share the Coptic collection with scholars around the world. This is one, an image of some of the restored Coptic parchment leaves. In addition to coordinating the restoration work between the Vatican and the Morgan Library, Father Evernot was hired to create a catalog raisonné of the manuscripts. The delay in restoration delayed him as well, but his task was enormous. In addition to his work at the, for the Morgan, he was professor at Catholic University and founder of their Semitics i -Corps department. He realized at the urging of Belle Green that he needed some assistance to complete the catalog raisonné. 
1929, when all the manuscripts and bindings had been returned to the Morgan Library, he hired Father Theodore C. Peterson, our hero, to be his assistant. Father Peterson was paid $100 a month by the Morgan Library. Peterson was a student of Semitic languages and his knowledge of Arabic, Hebrew, and Coptic were of great value to the catalog project. However, by 1931, it became clear that despite the addition of Peterson as an assistant, Father Evernot was no closer to completing the catalog resume. Because of the lack of tangible, tangible progress, Jack Morgan requested that Evernot stop work on the catalog. From the moment Father Peterson was hired by Father Evernot, he was interested in the book bindings of the collection. He decided to make scale drawings of the bindings and enlisted the staff of the Morgan in providing him with some books about bindings that would, quote, furnish me with a number of unfamiliar technical terms needed for a description of the Coptic bindings, unquote. He was not a bookbinder by trade or avocation. He began, to, began describing the bindings as part of the overall catalog with Father Evernot. Father Hebernot himself had written some descriptions of the bindings in 1919. The catalog raisonne was supposed to have a section about the bindings based on Father Hebernot's 1919 observations. But Father Peterson had a more ambitious idea in mind. In the fall of 1930, almost two years after first working with the, bind the bindings, Peterson submitted an article about them to Bell Green. He says in the article he is, quote, trespassing at times upon uncharted territory. My knowledge of the history of early book bindings is of only recent acquisition and perhaps not thorough enough, unquote. Green responded enthusiastically. She writes, quote, I have at last had an opportunity to quietly read your article on our Coptic book bindings. I find it excellent. So much so in fact, that I think it would be a great mistake to publish it in a periodical and much better to hold it for our own publication of the Coptic manuscripts, end quote. Thus encouraged, Peterson begins in-depth descriptions of each binding in the collection. He describes Coptic book bindings in general along the category seen on this slide. And then he writes specific descriptions of each of the 50 bindings by elaborating on their decoration, boards, sewing, headbands, end sheets, clasps, and markers. He also provides a line drawing of each binding. Even today, these drawings often serve as more accurate renditions of the bindings and seen them in person or via digital photography. It's an enormous task that he undertakes. He works continuously on the bindings description, with, which puts him at odds with Hebernot. Hebernot's catalog project was stopped in 1931, and he wasn't exactly thrilled with Peterson's continuation of the bindings work. They agreed to part ways, and Peterson takes on different teaching assignments at Catholic University and other schools. By 1933, he has written a Coptic book bindings manuscript that he presents to the Morgan Library. The monograph includes descriptions of 50 Coptic bindings of the Pierpont Morgan Library and a bibliographical review of 50 Coptic bindings from other collections. Green is enthusiastic about publishing, but the project is put in a state of suspended animation. Father Hebernot was still hopeful of producing a catalog of the manuscripts and Green, out of a great respect for him, did not want to preference Peterson's monograph. It wasn't until 1937, amid Evernot's failing health, that he agrees not to object to the publication of the bindings monograph. This release from Hebernot created an opportunity to publish in 1938. But now it is Peterson who cannot complete his work. He's teaching and moving and intermittently working on the monograph. A couple of years pass. Evernot dies in 1941. Another World War <laughs> interrupts the project. Jack Morgan dies in 1943. Finally, in 1946, Bell Green enlists Dorothy Minor, who formerly worked at the Morgan and was now keeper of manuscripts at the Walters Art Gallery in Baltimore, to shepherd the monograph to publication. Minor agrees to edit the book, but she must get up to speed on the project. She gets in touch with Peterson to let him know that the Morgan does want to publish a catalog of the Coptic bindings but that the monograph needs streamlining. She hopes to engage him in some rewriting and that it is, quote, definitely the duty of the Morgan Library to make this unrivaled collection available to students through proper descriptions and illustrations, unquote. Peterson is quite amenable, 
but it still takes a number of years to work through the rewrites, the edits, the additions and subtractions of the bindings information. Peterson finally delivers a complete monograph to the library in June 1949, 20 years after he started working on the morning. By 1949, Belle Green is no longer director of the Pierpont Morgan Library. She retired and was succeeded by Frederick B. Adams. Dorothy Minor, along with Meta Harson, curator of medieval manuscripts at the Morgan, championed the publication for Green to Adams. Adams is eventually enthusiastic about the monograph and contacts the Cambridge University Press about publication. He describes the book as consisting of two sections. The first, a detailed survey of book sewing and book binding in Egypt, and the second, will describe each Coptic binding in the library. He ultimately asks, quote, is the Cambridge University Press interested in cooperating with us in publishing this important, but doubtless unpopular book? <laughs> Close quote. Miraculously, the Cambridge University Press said yes. Peterson provides an outline for the forward to be written by, by Adams. Unfortunately, Bell Green dies in May 1950 without seeing the publication of the Coptic Bindings monogram. For reasons that remain unclear and perhaps in the end quite unknowable, Adams never wrote the foreword to the monograph. And in 1958, the contract for publication with the Cambridge University, Cambridge University Press was formally canceled. But fear not for the monograph. Like the hold Egypt had on J. Pierpont Morgan, Coptic bookbindings have been a lure for bookbinders everywhere. The monograph lived on in photocopies passed hand to hand among bookbinders for years. Kathy Baker at Legacy Press decided it was high time to finally publish Peterson's magnum opus. After a few additional starts and stops, I agreed to edit the monograph and write an introduction. The publication was championed for many years by William Bill Boakley, William Boakley, formerly head of medieval and Renaissance manuscripts at the Morgan, and then by Roger Wick, his successor and current head of medieval manuscripts at the Morgan. Bill was instrumental in the decision to digitally photograph all the bindings, work that was done by uh, the Morgan's former uh, staff photographer, Graham Haver. Um, and those are all the images that you'll be seeing. The confluence of digital photography, Peterson's original line drawings, and someone to edit the book provided the renewed impetus to publish the monograph. The result is a volume that consists of Peterson's introduction to Coptic bindings, the 50 in-depth descriptions of each binding, Peterson's line drawings, digital photography of the bindings, and Peterson's in-depth descriptions of 50 additional bindings from worldwide collections. So it's actually larger in scope than uh, what was proposed by the Cambridge Uni University Press. In the publication, the combination of digital photography and original line drawings provide the reader with a very accurate representation of the intricacies of the binding decoration. Peterson describes and illustrates every aspect of the construction of Coptic book bindings. One important aspect of this publication is that it locates Coptic bindings in the continuum of binding traditions. Major elements in the design, structure, and materials of the Coptic book have appeared in successive binding traditions, such as Ethiopic, Byzantine, Armenian, and Islamic book bindings. Hmm. There's a missing slide here, but it's, right, Peterson writes about end band structure, even though there's not much remaining evidence. Um, and there are many diagrams of sewing structures. This sewing structure is based on a manuscript at the Chester Beatty Library in Dublin and is, the, um, and is in the general description portion of the book. The board on the left is the back cover of the only manuscript written, written on papyrus and not on parchment. The book boards are mainly made up of layers of papyrus. Peterson distinguishes papyrus sheets made of one inch wide pith versus three inch wide pith. He is thorough and consistent in his descriptions. Um, the image on the right depicts how the pieces of parchment were adhered on the back of the, oh, let's see here. Um, we're missing a few images. Let's 
sorry. Well, the image on the right here depicts how the pieces of parchment were adhered on the back of the leather to create a visual contrast. Many cutouts on the bindings are in the shape of a cross, although geometric patterns dominate the style of decoration. The remnant of a linen spine lining is visible in the image on the left. The boards and spines of the text blocks were covered with linen. The end bands were then sewn through the linen linings. The leather then covered the linen and the boards. The leather punch work was done off the boards, but the inscribing was likely done after the boards were covered with leather. Some of the bindings have little or no decoration and are somewhat crude, but they are still uniformly made with papyrus boards covered with leather. Despite the bindings being cut from the manuscripts, the sewing remains intact enough to figure out the board attachment. Peterson describes the board attachment extensively. There are many instances where one can question its conclusions, but his firsthand descriptions are an important primary source of information on the binding structure. Some of the covers are painted and not inscribed or punched. Orpiment, an arsenic sulfide, is the bright yellow pigment used to paint the covers. The same mineral is used to decorate the pages of the text block. The books were held closed by a series of leather loops fastened over carved bone pegs that were inserted into the board edges. The pegs were removed during restoration treatment, but are preserved. One can see the pegs at the lower left of the image of the, on the left, and the drawing on the right depicts how they were inserted into the board edges. The top of the left-hand image here shows the loops that would wrap around the bone pegs of the upper board to keep the volumes closed. There were two loops at top edge and at the two at the bottom edge of the boards and three at the fore edge. So they were very securely closed. This inner board shows linen spine linings, the remains of board attachment sewing, and the tails of the leather loops that were anchored through the boards. Some of the papyrus boards were augmented with scraps of parchment or were covered with flour paste or stucco and chalk. And unfortunately, this image is not on there, but if it were, uh, this is a binding that consisted of very thick boards that were made up of a slurry of hemp or straw, uh, straw fibers pasted and pressed together. Um, the board edges were cut clean, suggesting that they were cut from a larger board. It's unique in the collection. It's unique because there's no image of it. Um, I seem to be losing my... Okay. The most elaborate binding, MSM 569, the Gospels volume, has a red leather tracery adhered to the boards. The red leather likely came from a binding or leather work from at least a century earlier. There are only a couple of other known bindings with similar decoration. Both are described by Peterson. This image of the binding from the Austrian National Library is reproduced from a fairly rare reference book of the collection that dates to the first half of the 20th century, a reference book in the Morgan Library. That same reference book appears to be the source for Peterson's line drawing. One of the more remarkable aspects of his research is his description of bindings from collections around the world. In addition to using reference material, he was in communication with scholars working with collections throughout Europe to augment his research and complete his monographs. He provides a frankly incredible description of the Freer Gallery's Washington Mon manuscript of the Gospels, which dates to the fourth or fifth century. I made the editorial decision to publish the monograph as it was given to the Morgan for publication in 1949. I took a sort of time capsule approach to the editorial process. I wanted to place the publication back in its timeline, but that doesn't mean that there have not been important additional Coptic manuscripts and bindings discovered since then. At the Morgan alone, there are two important fifth century wooden board Coptic manuscripts and bindings added to the, added to the collections in 1949. One is the very famous Glacier Codex with its leather straps and bone pegs. This binding would have been a precursor to the later Hamuli bindings. It is of a smaller size and has wooden instead of papyrus boards, but it's a clear precedent to the 9th and 10th century Coptic collection. Additionally, 
MSM 910 is a fifth century parchment text block with wooden boards. Both the Glacier Codex and M910 were acquired after 1960, so it would have been unknown to Peterson. But the Coptic collection, already being a, a part of the Morgan collection, made these two bindings perfect additions to the Morgan's holdings. The Morgan also has in its collection three wooden Coptic writing boxes that contain writing styluses and the remain of, remains of ink and pigment. And I think the, 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 the box on the bottom actually has uh, the, or, the yellow orpiment that was used to decorate the, the, the manuscripts. Um, these boxes date to the Humuli find, but were not included in Peterson's book. Uh, I'm actually a little bit curious about that. I never haven't been able to figure that out. Um, there are, however, in Leo Dupuy's two volume publication about the Morgan's Coptic collection, uh, they are talked about in this uh, two volume collection publication uh, that was published in 1993. Uh, this publication is as close as one can get to the original idea of Hebernaut's catalog, um, detailing the contents of the manuscripts and highly recommended as a resource. And of course, I would also highly recommend Peterson's Coptic Book Findings in the Pierpont Morgan Library for an as yet unsurpassed in-depth examination of every aspect of Coptic findings. Thank you. So there are a couple of people who um, uh, I should have talked about at all. <laughs> so uh, Deborah Evitz was the longtime uh, uh, book conservator, Drew Hines book conservator at the Morgan. Um, she started there, I believe, in uh, 1969 um, until about uh, two, 2000, 2002, somewhere in there. Um, she 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 worked did incredible work on preserving the collection for the Morgan. Um, she um, started a rehousing project, um, preserved um, a lot of the the original bindings. Um, she she just really took care of the collection. And then when uh, Maria Fredericks, the, the former Drew Hein book conservator, now head of the department, uh, and I uh, started there we kind of took the baton from all the great work that she had done and um we 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 sort of uh updated the, the housing with like more uh recent material you know uh approved conservation materials you know how materials sort of change over the years and it's like what was good 40 years ago 30 years 20 years ago you shouldn't use anymore so we tried to you know provide um we rehoused everything um i think it made it easier also to, to access um, Deborah had made these wonderful folders, but every time you had to access them, um, you had to kind of unwrap them. And so what we did was create um, these sort of uh, housings so that you could see uh, one side and you could safely flip it over and see the other side and you wouldn't have to remove it out of uh, sort of the housing that we created. Um, so that, that's the, the main thing has been to be able to safely rehouse it and I think it's really allowed um, a lot of um, uh, researchers to come and actually look at the material, um, digitizing them, and, and the curators put them all on online. They're all available on the uh, Corsair, the, the Morgan Library's um, 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 on, online um, catalog. Um, actually, the, the Coptic bindings have their own section. Uh, <laughs> um, so they're available. Um, Georgios Budalis, who's done a lot of really wonderful work on sewing structures of Coptic bindings and, and Byzantine bindings, um, really uh, bindings of the, the Eastern Mediterranean basin. Um, he had an exhibition actually at uh, Bard. And because we we're able to safely house them and to, uh, look after them, we loaned a few items to that show. And we're we're also able to loan, you know, we we, we bagged like, you know, little pieces of end bands that were just floating around and we separated those and everything sort of like 
pretty well cataloged now and accessible. And I think it's really opened up uh, new avenues of research. I think it's really, a, uh, we really feel like it's, a, it's an extension of what Morgan and Green really envisioned, which is just like, you know, uh, photographing them, providing these to scholars uh, as a secondary resource. And I think now we, we can sort of uh, provide a kind of a primary access to them because of the way in which we're, we're, we're rehousing and making them available. Yeah. So, but but actual like repair and touch ups and stuff like that. It's you know uh, some of them are much easier to kind of handle, and some of them you just you don't even you don't want to breathe on them. You know they're just sort of falling apart quite a bit. So yeah. Um, Yes. And then you mentioned some of the later ones were wood. So I should, I, that, sorry, that was a little bit confusing. The wooden ones were actually earlier. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. Sort of like the history of the material, like what are some challenges in terms of conservation? So um, it appears that um, they, they're a handful. Um, so this just says, I'm sorry, this just says I'm muted and I'm blank here, so I don't know. No, you should be, okay. it should be coming through. You're, you're on your Okay, cool. Um, I feel like narcissist. Um, <laughs> I can't see myself. Um, so the, they're, they're only actually, they are only a handful of really early bindings and they're um, with wooden boards. Uh -huh. And another person who I wanted to mention who has made, done some incredible, uh, really great research um, is uh, John Sharp, who's uh, John Lauren Sharp, who's a, a, a scholar of all this material. And he's written a really wonderful article um, about like the, the small number of wooden board bindings and collections around the world. That's why the Morgan has two of them. I think there's one in uh, Barcelona, uh, the, 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 the Freer, um, um, the Freer um, has the Washington Gospels. Um, who else? Have, Princeton has the Shidey uh, Codex, and they're all they're, they're all uh, Coptic Museum in Cairo has the Mudil Psalter, and they're all about this big. They're all you know uh, the the Coptic bindings are about this big. So the, those early wood uh, apparently the wood is acacia wood. And you know, trees aren't super abundant in, uh, in the desert, um, and so it, it is interesting that the earliest forms of the bound codex um, are wooden boards, and then I think when you get into uh, Ethiopic bindings, also with wooden boards, acacia also. Um, but then when you get into the eighth, uh, ninth, tenth century, you actually have a lot more. Uh, books being made, and so what you have an abundance of papyrus to if you need more boards, uh, and it's probably just it's at that by that point it's easier to create uh, just boards made out of layers of papyrus and layers of papyrus, um, and the text blocks are parchment. There is the one um, MSM 636 that that text block is is um, papyrus, yeah. The, Nag the Nag Hammadi codices are on papyrus mm -hmm. with the leather wrapper. Those are third century, second century. Uh, those are also at the Coptic Museum. But that's really like, you know, it's, I think the other thing that's really fascinating about these is that I think people tend to make these sort of uh, general conclusions, which it's really easy to do. And I think the only caveat to that is like, this is the only stuff that remains, you know? So this is, it's a pretty small sample size. So uh, maybe some, some of the conclusions that we draw from them might be a little outsized, uh, but it's also the only thing that we've got, you know? So, yeah. There's a movement from away from the woods. Does that make them much lighter or more portable? You know, the, the wood's actually pretty light. I think, um, I think it's really like probably the, the since they got bigger, it, it probably is a combination of like I, I got larger. You probably want lighter boards, but the, the 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 layers of papyrus, you know, they get pretty heavy also. 
you know, and then covered with leather. Um, you saw like the glazier, those early manuscripts, uh, early wooden boards, um, they're just bare board. They don't, you know, they have like the, the, the leather is just on the spine. You know, you, you barely have any sort of uh, full leather covering um, um, in the really early stuff, fifth century, sixth century. So a goat skin, yeah, probably just like a like a red, reddish, reddish brown goat skin, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's all pretty much it's all uh, goat skin. There's a question in the chat that I can see on the screen. This is amazing. Um, we have a question called uh, the question is what are the texts you mentioned gospel? Oh yeah, so it's a lot of religious texts. It's a uh, the, the four gospels, um, their uh, synaxeries, it's like histories of, um, of saints, it's, uh, you know, uh, uh, letters, it's, um, it, it's various, um, various Coptic religious texts, you know, um, uh, of the, from, from, you know, the high to the low. So, it's, but it's, it's mainly, uh, yeah. Um, lists of saints <laughs> i think there might be a couple of like uh, just uh, um non non secular texts but it's really like um just the the, the the monastery sort of library of just like religious uh miscellaneous really you know yeah which is again what uh that's why you know hebernot and and peterson you know they're you know they they could read the Coptic. They could you know their their whole job was to basically like create a, a catalog resin of it, up to like you know explaining the whole thing. And that's actually what Dupuis ends up doing. Um, it's actually his dissertation, and he does that in 1993. And um, yeah, I mean that's a, a really great uh, resource. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know, it's it's um, there's so many like unknown variables there, and you know, I think one of the um, so if you go to a Coptic monastery in Egypt today, <laughs> which I, I, fortunately I have been uh, to the to the Red Sea monasteries, and um, the monasteries are built so that um, you know they're kind of in the middle of nowhere. They're monasteries, uh, uh, and you know. They're built so that they can like be totally shut off from the outside world should they be invaded because they're out there in the middle of nowhere. Not to mention, you know, you're talking about like the eighth, ninth, tenth centuries of their Christian, you know, in an Islamic, uh, primarily Islamic land, and there's uh, in, interreligious. Uh, problems or issues, you know, and so at any given time, you might need to uh, protect your monastery. And I think, you know, I think that that's probably as like, probably just needed to be hidden away, you know, and, and the fact that like, there's no other evidence, uh, probably is a good indicator that like, you know, uh, it, it's probably a good idea to, to, to hide it away. You know? But but I think some of the, some of the, the you know, some of the there is evidence in the in the colophons that some of the manuscripts traveled from one monastery to another. You know, they weren't just all written there; that they traveled from other places and and had like uh, they're very interesting. They have like descriptions of like who the 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 head abbot was and all these sorts of things. They're 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 really they have a lot of really fantastic um, information about the monastic uh, daily flow, you know, and, and personalities. But, um, and that's why, yeah, the, the find at Edfu, uh, the British Museum has a very nice collection and it's all like in one spot, you know. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, I think the same thing, like I think the Mudil Psalter in, in um, at the Coptic Muse Museum in Cairo was sort of found, uh, in the same sort of circumstances and and you know in the nagamari were found in you know the 
in caves, you know, just so, you know, it, it partially it's like, you know, these are, these are sort of desert cultures, of, desert religious cultures. So there's almost like, you know, they're there with the God in the desert. So there's a, uh, uh, just a, an aspect of just being like, you know, solitude and then all the, all the uh, problems that solitude in the desert and being on your own kind of follow, you know, but yeah. I don't know if that fully answers your question. <laughs> So it was really going through the text, um, even though it was edited, there were, it was unclear which version was last, you know, and so the Morgan had the there was the copy that was photo there was the photocopy that we have like had on our shelf in the reference library um but there were also um actually i went down to the archives at the at the at catholic university and there was a version there and it was unclear which one was final and i, I should mention also the the curator of that collection of the special collections there monica blanchard was very um very helpful in, in my research. Um, so it was then like reconciling what was really the final copy. And so that was a lot of just com comparing and contrasting. And there were some like, there were still some editorial decisions that were not complete. And the notes that we, that were in the, in the final copy that was at the Morgan, um, they were sort of suggestions. So I think I ended up dealing with that by, by saying, here's one version. And then there's a note <laughs> that's paper clipped to the <laughs> monograph that has like a couple of other sentences. So what I'm going to do here is put an asterisk and say the alternative version to this like section is this. And so you can sort of like then go back and like, uh, reread it in that way. And that, those are really the, the main editorial choices I made that were just like, let's throw um, more information at it or just a variation on, on the information on it. Um, and and um, yeah, I mean, I think that that's why, you know, uh, you know, Thank, uh, I'd like to once again thank uh, Kathy for her patience because she was like, so <laughs> do I have another Peterson on my hand here? Do I have another Hebrew on my hand? I'm like, what year were we going to publish that book? Uh, in two years time, right? She was like, no, last year. Um, and so, um, you know, she, I think one of the decisions that, that I made uh, that she supported was there's a, there's a lot more literature that has and a lot more uh, Coptic information that's out there between 1951 and 2022, right? Um, for me, that's like a whole other book. And I just felt like what I really wanted to do was to take all of this information and this story that is really like a Morgan history story also for me, and just kind of put it out there and just kind of take the book here in 2021 20, and put it back in 1951. And if there are mistakes and if things have been accessioned differently and stuff like that, you know, now you have the reference to say like, this is wrong. It's actually this now, but I, it just became this sort of like, uh, too, it became too large of a concept for me to start saying like, okay, if it's 304, this reference, you know, this, by, this is actually now this in this other collection. And I just was like, that's just gonna, there are too many, um, I had visions of like a uh, homeland and like, you know, strings of like tied to different photos and just kind of going crazy. So that's mainly I didn't want to go crazy. So. so how long has it been for you to do this? Yeah, you know, uh, 
I think it was supposed to come out pre-COVID. So, I mean, I think I, Kathy would have to double check me, but I think we started really talking about it in like 2016, something in, somewhere in there. And I think 2017, and I think we were kind of aiming for like 2019. And, and you know, I was like, sure. And I was like, I, I would say, I feel really, uh, I feel okay saying this. I also feel very like slightly, or pretty guilty saying this, but I was like, you know, people were like, how was, you know, the pandemic for you? And I was, I'm always like, oh, it was great, you know, because I was like at home for two years and I finished the book, you know, but I think I know it was like difficult for everybody. But uh, it really was just like having that extended period of time to just sort of sit and, and just just figure out like all the all the, the, the permutations and the, the differences. And it really was like the, the archive at Catholic was uh, was really uh, very, very helpful. And Actually, the archives at um, at the Walters were really helpful from the Dorothy Miner's point of view because uh, she she had such an enormous impact on getting this out, you know, and editing and and really uh, coming into the situation and being like, what is going on here, you know? And and Belle, you know, she was she she was older, she'd kind of run out of steam on this thing, and she'd been dealing with it for a long time, so she just needed somebody to come in and and finish it up for her, you know. Um, so. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm just going to come back on screen for the people at home. Um, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, thank you again, Frank. Um, this has been absolutely fascinating. We're going to have one more talk coming up on no March. Wait, November. November 17th um, with Russell Moret. So um, stay tuned for that and we hope to see you again soon. Take care.